My name is Jasmine Slusser, and I'm a student at the George Washington University. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you why I believe that the protection of keystone species is the key to a sustainable future and an engaged public. However, first, we need to rethink and redefine what it means to be a keystone species. Often, the first image that comes to mind when we think of keystone species is a species lying in the middle of an interconnected web of delicate interactions between wildlife and their natural habitats. According to current literature, keystone species have a disproportionately large effect on the biodiversity within the communities they occur. In the case of the majestic salmon, the salmon act as a vital food source to orca, eagles, and bears. But the cycle doesn't end there. Flies lay their eggs in the remaining carcass, ooh, um, which will grow up to pollinate the surrounding forest, and the salmon's bones will be absorbed by nearby plants and trees. So, what if instead of confining our definition of keystone species to a romantic 18th century aesthetic of a wild forest, we take into consideration the effects these species have on new man-made landscapes and anthropogenic ecosystems? In my opinion, by not incorporating the impacts that keystone species have on humans and our built environments, we lose a pivotal opportunity for humans to connect with the nature around them and create new and necessary multidisciplinary wicked solutions. I will demonstrate how policies which prioritize the protection of keystone species offer economic, environmental, and equitable benefits to all. So let's begin. Today I will offer a new example of what it can mean to be a keystone species using a current ecosystem that quite literally exists in our own backyard. For those of you that do not know, George Washington University has an on-campus urban apiary right across U Yard atop Bell Hall. Therefore, the protagonist of this story is, you guessed it, the honeybee. And no, I am not talking about the Jerry Seinfeld movie. Now, most of you already know the basics. Bees are important for honey and flowers, but today I am going to challenge your perception of what this small but mighty insect actually does for our community. I was inspired to share this story as I actually worked for the apiary during the summer of 2020. In fact, that's me in the scary hazmat suit. During my time there, I learned how all of the research that is conducted is student-led and how the lab offers an opportunity for young students to step up as leaders and have them conduct research and find solutions to threats that they have recognized within their respective communities. The lab's most recent publications explore how pesticides used on almond trees affect the behavioral and health effects of honeybees and the risks of urban honeybees using discarded sugary beverages as a means of food. Both topics hold profound economic and environmental implications for agriculture and climate change. However, I quickly learned that the work of honeybees and the lab lie far beyond UYARD as the apiary not only offers educational services to local schools, but is actually funded by a local restaurant you may have heard of. Founding Farmers, located less than a block away, has founded the GW Buzz Lab since 2011. In fact, if you were to go over to the restaurant and ask for a cup of tea, you would also receive this teaspoon, which has a picture of a bee and commemorates the beginning of their partnership. As many of you may have suspected, the honey that is produced by the apiary on campus is then given to founding farmers and incorporated in their meals. This farm-to-table ideology encourages the purchase of local produce, supports local economies, and protects the environment by reducing emissions related to produce transportation and preservation. However, the honeybees are not restricted to the confines of the urban apiary, but instead act as pollinators to the entire GW campus including the campus's Grow Garden. The Grow Garden, located three blocks away from the apiary, is a student-run garden which provides the produce it grows to Miriam's Kitchen, which we will discuss in a moment. However, students can also obtain fresh produce from the garden or through the garden's community-supported agriculture program, which connects them to local farmers in the area. In this way, Grow Garden is offering an accessible and affordable source of produce to students. Finally, by pollinating this garden, honeybees offer the community around them a green gathering space and tree coverage. 
every time I walk by, there's someone either taking their lunch break underneath a tree or someone walking by is trying to sneak a peek at what's growing. One block over from Grow Garden lies Miriam's Kitchen, which takes the produce grown and transforms it into delicious high-end meals, which are often given to individuals who are low income or unhoused. According to the organization, Everyone Home DC, while Black and African Americans make up 46.6% of DC's population, they account for 86.4% of the city's homeless population. This picture is a meal that was served when I was volunteering and includes stuffed French toast with Nutella drizzle, hash browns, fresh fruit salad, and eggs. As a volunteer, I was able to receive one of these meals, and let me tell you, it was one of the nicest meals I have ever had. Even more impressive is the fact that the kitchen provides over 75,000 meals at no cost to recipients. Miriam's Kitchen is truly dedicated to not only providing physical nourishment, but also lifting up guests while recognizing their innate dignity as humans. In fact, in addition to meals, Miriam's Kitchen offers guests access to social workers, clothing, mail services, and toiletries. Miriam's Kitchen is also committed to securing permanent housing for all those who are unhoused and advocating for local policies which support all members of the community. In these ways, honeybees help to sustain not just the patrons of founding farmers and local students, but individuals of all backgrounds at Miriam's Kitchen and encourage all stakeholders to have a voice in local sustainability. Finally, as a result of these positive cumulative contributions by honeybees, honeybees also help to improve the community health of humans surrounding them. As we saw with founding farmers, Grow Garden, and Miriam's Kitchen, Diets filled with fruits and vegetables can lower blood pressure, decrease risk of heart disease and stroke, and decrease the risk of eye and digestive conditions. Additionally, green spaces protect against mood disorders, depression, neurotic behavior, and stress-related issues. In fact, one study found that citizens who grew up with the least green space nearby had as much as a 55% increased risk of developing psychiatric disorders such as depression, anxiety, and substance abuse in later years. I hope you can see that by investing in the protection of keystone species, which support the underlying foundation for entire communities, we can stimulate local economies, help green spaces flourish, and provide fresh produce to all residents. Therefore, I urge you to rethink and redefine what it means to be a keystone species, and in doing so, help connect individuals to the living creatures which make their lives possible, and encourage them to protect these species before it's too late. Perhaps by expanding our definition of keystone species and exploring our interdependence with one another, we can encourage leaders of businesses, universities, nonprofits, and medical institutions to come together to tackle critical threats to the environment, food systems, climate justice, and our collective futures. Thank you.